Hello and welcome to the second episode of the National Outdoor Pod Show. If you missed out on last week's episode, then make sure to head to our channel and catch up before enjoying this water-themed show. Don't forget that our sponsors Yonder are giving away the ultimate swimmers bundle. Enter that competition now by clicking the link in the description. Don't forget you can either watch or listen to these episodes, but make sure to leave a like and let us know what you think. Here's what's coming up in this week's episode. A two-part interview with none other than headline speaker Ben Fogel. Then we move on to the National Outdoor Expo event director Tom, who takes to the lake in a Yonder wetsuit. Make sure you're being safe while swimming with Nauka's brand new tech. No, it's not a triathlon without the bike, so hear what Swim Run is all about. And finally, learn how you can play your part in being a sustainable adventurer with Taz from Dry Rope. Now, let's head over to the hosts. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode two of the National Outdoor Pod Show, kindly brought to you by Yonder, who are giving away the ultimate swim bundle. So click on the notes in the show notes and you'll be able to find out how to enter that competition. So today's episode is all about water and adventures on water. And I'm going to talk to our two hosts about stuff that they've done. So Elise, talk to me about water. water. What do you do in the water? So I do do quite a bit of cold water swimming, somewhat reluctantly I started <laughs> doing it in lockdown like a lot of people I was living in Bristol and there was a bit of river that we could walk it was like three miles from the house and honestly it felt like paradise walking there and yeah, getting bet. water mm. although now I think is that a clean bit of water but now oh. yeah it wasn't the best start but and then I just made all these friends ba- I think the thing I love about cold water swimming is there's this huge community around it and I it kind of accidentally just started centering my whole social life around getting into cold water and now I'm like it doesn't even matter if I like doing it or not I have to I wouldn't have any friends <laughs> so, but I think that community is because it is a weird hobby you kind of travel for an hour to go get in some water for three minutes yeah but weirdly it does make you feel good yeah but it it and, and talk about the benefit because this has become a thing now mm. cold mm. water therapy and I've actually done some ice baths and things like that and it's it's, it's really quite invigorating, right? Yeah. You've done it as well, too. Yeah, yeah, I've done it as well. It is it is amazing. It's mm. so good for you. So good for your mental health, everything going on, all good for, like, circulation. Mm. And it's got super popular. I think it's Wim Hof just really pumped that mm. one up, didn't he? So it's, it's great for the recovery side of things. Mm. But then there's there's obviously going on and doing events in water, and you've done swim runs, right? Yeah, so I, I've done, yeah, I did a swim run, which is basically where you do the whole thing in your wetsuit and your trainers. And unlike a triathlon or a duathlon or something, you don't really have set transitions the whole time. So we like the one I did was in the Lake District, and I think we had 20 different transitions. So you're like swimming across a lake, running over a mountain, in and out of the water. That's and cool. And it did yeah. feel yeah. like a proper adventure. Like it felt like, like, and you do it with a teammate, which was really nice. I did it with my friend Sophie. You have to be tied together, right? Or, or within certain distance. Yeah, you have to be within 10 metres. And yeah. in the swim, you often have a tether. Yeah. Sophie was a much better swimmer than me, so that was good because she dragged me along. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. it was actually really nice because normally Sophie's faster than me anyway, so we'll go to a running race. We don't see each other for the whole race, and then we have a beer afterwards. It was nice at the swim run to actually, well, she so had to stay with me. <laughs> yeah, basically, you just tied yourself to yeah. her so that she could <laughs> hang out with you. I like that. It's a good way of doing it. So, Tanuke, you, the, the sort of, some of the stuff you did on Survivor was quite mm-hmm. water-related, right? Yeah, there was a lot of water um, activities or, like, lots of them were, like, swimming out, diving down, getting keys like I was saying um there was another water one where we were tied we were we were tied together about eight of us tethered to each Mm. other and then there was one team on one side and then one team on the other side and we basically had to run in the water to try and catch the other team and half of it was on um like closer to the mm. land so it was shallower and then the other bit was lower down so it was deeper obviously i'm five foot two <laughs> and it was literally like oh up, my to my, uh, up to my shoulders plus we were holding um, massive sandbags at the same time oh as well it was an epic race <laughs> it was crazy and like luckily our team we won by the way smashed it how long was the race it lasted for so <laughs> long by the end i think we were all so fatigued like people were just mm. like collapsing like the medics were on oh it was God. it was crazy and the other team they would got their sandbags wet so it, it doubled the weight and also we had slightly different tactics but in the end we managed to catch the other team this sounds like it was brutal. prison yeah. it's oh. not like this is not <laughs> oh. okay you're saying that, it was such a smile on your face yeah. because but i won hey That's do you remember why. the time i nearly drowned it was great <laughs> no <laughs> that wasn't even the worst one the time we nearly drowned in that show right so we were underneath a cage 
and the cage was like the water was here and we were breathing through a hole and every 10 minutes they lowered the cage down oh, and no. we went on for um two hours and the water was like the the tide was coming in so you basically yeah it was just like drowning us on national TV. I mean, this is not something that we would recommend <laughs> to uh, all I'm our not audience. I'm sure you're selling water yeah. here <laughs> yeah, as a concept. So we've talked, but we've talked about ridiculous torture and we've talked about <laughs> swim runs and things like that and cold water therapy. But actually, what about surfing? Have any of you guys done surfing? Yeah, I've done some surfing. Re that was new to me, actually, recently. Um, but I have done electric surfboarding. What's electric well, surfboarding? Which, which was pretty epic. It's basically... Uh, a surfboard it's a bit more like a boogie board maybe um, and you have a little rope at the front you hold on to and then you have a toggle in your hand that does the speed so you can go up to I think you can go up to like 40 miles an hour what? it was well, hang wild on. to go up to 40 miles an hour you have to be able to stand up you have to stand up <laughs> and you're, you're holding on you've got your knees bent you, your weight has to be like nice and in the centre and you obviously want to be going not into the waves um, and you just just go for it that sounds yeah. so fun. It was fun. so fun. It was hard, but I think I got it because I do obviously lots yeah. of roller skating, so that helped with the balance. Mm. But, um, yeah, it was really fun. You should try it out. Have yeah, I'm not at home on a surfboard. <laughs> I Every year for the past 10 years, me and my uni friends have been on a surfing weekend. I had never been able to manage to stand up once, so I booked a lesson a couple of years ago, and it was just me, and the only thing I was useful for was carrying the children in the lessons boards for them. Oh. And they were, uh, and I just, I think like you said, like you've got that like balance, the balance back, yeah. and I just, that's everything I'm not good at. It was upper body strength, it was coordination, yeah. it was reading a wave. So <laughs> I'll keep going every year. I hope to stand up one day. Yeah, like I that. went to the wave in Bristol, mm. which is kind of, I don't know if you guys have been, but it's like an inland artificial reef. And it's incredible, yeah. amazing facilities. And we spent, I think, two hours there. And I think I vaguely stood up once and nice. then kept falling face first <laughs> into, the, into the wave. So it's really hard, but it was actually really rewarding. And I kind of, I think the water adventures are actually really quite exciting. And I think people yeah. should really try and get more active in the water as opposed to necessarily always on land. It's quite cool, right? Yeah. I think the sea is just such a... I so, how, how, how do I say it without saying the sea is massive? It's just such a big <laughs> thing. And yeah. like, so I think there's just something... Like I ha have a lot of um, admiration for, like... I love listening to podcasts like Big Wave Surfers and how they can like read the water. Like, I yeah, think that's, that's so awesome. impressive. Yeah, impressive. Yeah, you can spot it. So, guys, if you're here for educational content, the sea is massive. <laughs> so that's the kind of highbrow stuff that we talk <laughs> about here on the National Outdoor Pod Show. Um, so big thank you to our sponsors, Yonder, who are giving away the ultimate swim bundle. So keep an eye on that in the show notes and on to the big interview for today. I'm ready to take notes for this one, so sit back, relax, and enjoy this interview with Ben Fogel and Tanuke. Welcome back to one of the more exciting parts in our pod show, in my opinion, as I am joined here by Ben Fogel. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. How's it going? I'm, I'm loving this whole setup here. I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It feels yeah, quite yeah, Christmassy. Yeah. I smell pine. Randomly Christmassy. Yeah. Uh, we've got a fire. We've got yeah. just about everything we Could need. almost be outdoors indoors <laughs> exactly <laughs> how's it going it's busy your chat earlier was huge well, so, do you know i love coming here i love to meet people who have watched my shows yeah. over the years i get to i get to kind of get some feedback yeah uh, from people who have championed me uh since i started out so i love yeah. coming here and i am a complete geek when it comes to 100 stuff so <laughs> i am going to have a little look around later yeah. and uh, try not to buy too much stuff yeah fair enough fair enough i've been doing exactly the same i think i've signed up to about every trip mm -hmm. uh, there is possible and i'm mm -hmm. going to be busy for the next couple of years but i think that's the point isn't yeah it? that is the point i would love to talk seeing as we um are on water in this episode obviously I know that you've done a lot with water but one of my favorite things that I've seen personally was the row that you did mm. across the Atlantic I'd love to know a little bit about that that looked insane that was <laughs> that was of all the kind of ocean stuff I've done I've done a lot of sailing I've yeah. done a lot of kayaking I'd say that was that was kind of the biggest challenge I've done full stop so so yeah. that was the row across the Atlantic 3,000 miles, which I did yeah. quite a long time ago now. I yeah. feel like I'm living on past glories, but it was about <laughs> 15 years ago. Uh, no, longer. It was actually nearly 20 years ago now. Incredible. And it was a complete 
life changing experience on every level. Mm. I couldn't say with hand on heart I enjoyed it. Yeah, um, it, it didn't look that enjoyable. I won't it, lie. <laughs> but but it's all about your I think your ment your mental state mm -hmm. and your mental place. And I think I had completely underestimated. Oh really? What it would be like? Yeah. I've actually I've just started kind of fantasizing about doing it again. Oh really? Because I think if I did it now. I'd enjoy it a whole lot more. Mm, in what way? Because I've had uh, I've had a lifetime of experiences since then, mm. and I have put myself under pressure. I have, I think I've learnt to understand how my brain works now. Yeah. And I think I would go into it with a very different mentality. It was just it, it felt really arduous at the time, mm. which is it's supposed to be. It was a race. And yeah. I did go with an Olympian, which which added an extra pressure to it mm -hmm. but I kind of feel now age 50 having done all the things I've done it would mm. be a really fascinating thing to revisit yeah to see whether it would be more fun with a completely different mindset is there anything you'd change from what you did last time yeah I would try to enjoy it more I yeah, think I think I went into the last one almost not wanting to enjoy it okay yeah and yeah. I think if I went into it this time it's amazing the power that we can have over how much we enjoy an experience mm -hmm. or not. And and I often say this to people, it can be with your work life, it can be with your relationships, with your friendships. If you go in with a negative mm -hmm. mentality and there's any part of you that just thinks you're not going to enjoy it, you're not going to enjoy yeah. it. Yeah. I mean it's it's pretty simple philosophy. I'm not a great <laughs> I'm, I'm not gonna join the the great philosophers with that statement, but I think if you go in just thinking, okay, here's a three thousand mile row, I might well be at sea for many, many months, and I'm going to be tired and I'm going to be seasick and it's going to be quite monotonous mm -hmm. and things will break and it's gonna be scary. Uh, you know, if you can accept all of those things but then harness all of the above positives all, yeah but, but above all listen i like this is a watery show that we're on now i love water mm. some people have a real connection and affinity to water i i believe we are you know we are 70 plus percent water yeah so i think it makes sense that lots of us feel really at home and a connection to it mm. just go back to the victorian times and you know all our seaside resorts were a place yeah. of retreat it was for mm. health health and well-being mm. and the reason was because people knew the value of getting into salt water of getting into cold water of listening to water of looking at water and i the reason i love watery adventures is because I feel like I'm where I belong yeah and not everyone has that by the way but I certainly do and I think that the reason I'm disappointed I didn't enjoy the row as much mm. as I should have is because I should have been in paradise yeah. I should have loved yeah. every single minute if you'd of have it. just let go yes. of it and just let yourself I was enjoy too it. controlling yeah 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 everything's easy in hindsight though yeah, isn't I it? Know. Like, and like, by the way I wish I just enjoyed it at the time it's and like, by the way I'll add a caveat that I think if I ever did do it again I'd, it would probably be just as miserable yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah I it, I do also feel that same connection with water and it definitely resonates with me about you saying how if you can just the power of your mind over your situation, I definitely do do that in most of my situations when I'm going off on adventures as well. And just pushing yourself to, you know, mind over matter, essentially. Yeah, you can't underestimate yeah, it. Yeah, you, know, you can't. I, I've said this a, a number of times now of all the kind of physical... I th Listen, there are some great physical adventurers out there yeah. who are hardcore and tough. Yeah. I'm not one of those people. I am ambitious and bold, but I do have a very strong willpower. Mm. And, and it's my brain and willpower that has... Got me got through, through all of my challenges, not my rippling muscles, which I don't, <laughs> I don't have, I'm afraid. What would you say would be one of your most sort of like monumental, apart from the rowing one that we just discussed? Was there ever a, a moment when you realised this is more than just a hobby? Do you know what I mean? It's something that you realised it was going to be your life's work. I mean... That very first experience I had of taking part in that reality show, Castaway, mm -hmm. which was a whole year, was I, 
I can't diminish the importance that that had in my life in mm. giving me the opportunities, but also, you know, to take part in a project unpaid as a volunteer for a whole year yeah. is a is a pretty big investment. Yeah. And that year, you know, it was an island, so I was close to water. I absolutely yeah. loved it. It was quite cold water because it was the Hebrides of, of Scotland. But I I think that was that was the kind of time when I remember just going for walks thinking I would be quite happy doing this forever. Yeah. Somehow. How old were you then? I would have been in my my early to mid twenties or yeah. so. So I'd done a lot of travel yeah. by then. I I had spent years living in Central and South America. I had gone to university in Costa Rica. I had. I, it's I, already I, in you. Yeah, yeah. The, the adventure was already there. But I think that it was this. It was a really simple. It was a simple place. You mm. know, there's different tiers of adventure, aren't there? And c- yeah. coming to the show here, you'll see that. And a lot of people sometimes get a bit misguided that adventure has to be Everest or mm-hmm. rowing the Atlantic, mm-hmm. but it doesn't. Mm. A- adventure can be going to an Outer Hebridean island. Adventure can be going to. Um, the Peak District, yeah. and and that's what I always try to remind people: don't get, don't get blinded by this notion that you have to follow in the sp- footsteps of, uh, of those great uh, explorers of old. Mm. I I definitely feel that as well, especially like I'm I'm a city girl, I'm a London London born bred, and adventure for me st- has always been just to get me outside of London you know and then once you get a taste for it then you can start building and doing bigger and bigger but it's definitely about starting small that's how I feel like I started and I guess how sort of most people start isn't it don't worry part two of Ben's interview is coming up a little bit later but now it's time to stick my boss in a wetsuit in a freezing cold lake Hi, I'm Tom from the National Outdoor Expo. Uh, We're here at the NEC, at the outside section of the show, getting ready to go into the lake. I'm here to test the Yonder Ghost 3, um, the top uh, top of the range triathlon and open water swimming wetsuit. So being their top of the range wetsuit, this would be ideal for triathlon and open water swimming. Um, It is an extremely flexible and very, very buoyant wetsuit. Now I'm gonna pop it on and get in the lake and see how we get on. That was incredible. What an amazing suit. I'm absolutely freezing now, so I'm gonna go in. Enjoy the rest of the show. That's definitely gonna be coming up in my performance review. Now let's stay with swimming with Nauka and a bit of tech. Hi there, and welcome to the tech section of this pod show. I'm obviously talking about all things water, and I'm joined here by Rick from Nauka, who's gonna fill me in on their new open water swimming app. Yeah, so Please. we've, we've um, produced a new app called Noka Wild. Noka Wild. And it's for people that predominantly want to go and swim on their own mm-hmm. or with other people or other friends. And uh, um, we've added a layer of safety for them by allowing them to pin their swim, which will notify somebody where they are, mm-hmm. what time they're going in. And um, God forbid there was an accident, they, that's the first place you're going to start looking for them. Um, but when they finish their swim, they uh, pin their swim again, they stop the swim, notifies yeah. the, s- the person that they've designated that they're out safely. Um, and that, that trail is, is an, a- this an added layer of safety and with a lot of other features as well. Yeah, that sounds like I can't believe that that's not already a thing. Do you know what I mean? That sounds so dangerous to not have someone to know where you are um, and also you would feel so much more comfortable having your whole thing tracked. I mean, normally it's just like you have a brightly coloured 
sort of boy attached to you yeah. now but this is adding a yeah. whole new level to it yeah so the, the the app will allow you to actually track your swim as well with yeah. gps so yeah. um you like you say with the these toe floats are really useful because they yeah. do give you that visual aspect of the bright color but you can put a, a phone in there and keep it dry yeah and, but and and then when you finish your swim not only um do we know where you've been but you you know and you can see it and historical data you can keep. Um, so it, it does track. It's, it's like a sort of a Strava version for swimming. Yeah. And I suppose you can sort of like set goals for yourself and see how well you did like last week and sort of add on. And Yeah, we've always tried to um, add more value to what we're doing. And um, with our managed venues, we have thousands. We've got 50,000 swimmers who, who use that system. But... Um, not all of them go for it, but some of them love to see their swim totals going up. They love to um, know more about what they've been doing. So I did this swim here on this day. Why was it shorter than when I did the last mm. week? Well, because the temperature was, was two degrees lower or um, or the weather conditions were, were worse. So we give that to, to them because we like to add that value. Um, but we also have race timing built in because we yeah, know people love that. They love to measure themselves. Yeah. So we we do a um, in our managed venues we do a thing called the Noka Swim, which we like to sort of um, kind of s- it's it's like the wet version of part rum. If nice. you know if you know yeah. what that is. So um, a free swim once a week where you can measure yourself against what you previously did, um, but it's free. Oh, perfect. Mm. Even better. Yeah. And this app's all up and running now. And yeah, so um, the, the we've got two apps. Mm-hmm. So we've got one called Actio, A-C-T-I-O, and that's uh, a really simple user journey for people who want to book a swim and go and be managed and kept safe. Um, Noka Wild is out there, Play Store, App Store, and um, um, free to download, um, lots of free features, but some of it is has to be paid for. And, uh, and that includes personal accident insurance as well. So for every swim you do, as long as you pinned your swim and created a record, you've got that insurance as a peace of mind. You know, if you did damage yourself, if you've tripped over a rock or something and yeah. can go to work the next day, you are insured. Wow, that sounds like an invaluable bit of kit. And I would definitely, I think, I have never really done as much sort of wild swimming as I would like to. So if I, yeah, now I know about you guys. I'm into Fantastic. it. Fantastic. Yeah, see you out there. Yeah, I will be. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, and moving on with the next segment of the show. A park run for swimming sounds like an absolute joy. Now let's head back to Tanuke and Ben for part two of their interview. Yeah, and, you know, that's probably one of our similarities is yeah. that I grew up in central London. Yeah. I, I grew up in a house that didn't have a garden, didn't have any space. It was mm. in, you know, right in the middle of w1 in london it couldn't yeah. have been more central and for me although i kind of i still love london as a city i think it's exciting i, mm. I think you can get you can have plenty of adventures in urban areas oh, by the way <laughs> uh, but i for, i loved getting out and getting out meant i was lucky enough to go down to cornwall mm-hmm. i was lucky enough to go up to some of the scottish islands when i was a child and actually, Dad is Canadian, so I spent a lot of my summers out in Canada mm-hmm. in the lakes there. So I was always watery. It was yeah. always kind of um, I was always close to either fresh or, or salt water. And I think it, my advice to people is always start small. Yeah. Don't, don't be too ambitious. I was with Frankie today. I don't know if you've met Frankie yeah. yet, but you know you can be eight years old and he and, is and, incredible. And, and he, that's so the lovely. kind. He is exactly the kind of person I want to inspire. He Mm -hmm. knows exactly what he wants to do. Yeah. He knows what gives him great happiness and satisfaction. And he's eight years old. I I can't believe he's just eight years old, honestly. I I don't know what I was doing at eight years old. But we need to have more Frankies. Yeah. yeah? And and this is my big thing is to access not just the youth, but also Mm -hmm. minority groups. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm aware that my profile is very typical of mm. the outdoor world. Mm. And what I have tried to do over the years is to either champion or encourage those who traditionally haven't necessarily been to uh, outdoor places yeah. and, and the wild. And I think we just need to start with the Frankies of this world and yeah. his demographics, start yeah. in schools with people of all backgrounds yeah. and make sure that they know 
that it's possible, it's possible yeah. and, and accessible yeah. and is for everyone. Mm. That's, that's my thoughts. It is. And I, I can see it changing the scene bit by bit, slowly but surely. You know, like even, you know, people like me haven't normally do adventurous stuff mm -hmm. full stop like mm -hmm. i i always remember like so many of my friends you know we don't go swimming we don't do heights we definitely don't do bugs camping and mm -hmm. dirt and all that stuff and it is it is changing a little bit bit by bit but it's and it's a really you know you use this term we yeah as if see i i would genuinely like to think that i am completely blind to uh, like a person is a person yeah for me and i realize that circumstances are different mm -hmm. and according to your circumstances maybe outdoor spaces have traditionally not been so accessible, uh, accessible or, or, or normalized or normalized yeah. exactly but apart from that there's whoever you are i mean I've, whoever i have met in the world has always appreciated that connection to nature and hearing yeah. birdsong yeah. and having either a cold wind on your face or the nice warm sunshine. Yeah. You know, I defy anyone to not say, like, I'm into my cold water therapy right now. Yeah, same. Yeah, and I know lots of people hate it. I guarantee, and you'll know, so you recognise yeah. this, we will take someone of whatever background and by the time they have got in and got out, They'll they will be buzzing and they will be yeah. so excited yeah. and that for me is what accessibility should yeah. be yeah mm -hmm. so whether it is just getting into a cold bathtub which is what we're talking about yeah <laughs> but it's the feeling you get from that and and yeah. that's what i really want to try and encourage the frankies and the the, the minority groups mm -hmm. who traditionally haven't been able to experience the profound yeah. life-changing V values of, of those spaces outdoors, yeah. yeah i mean even with all that cold water stuff it's the stuff that it's the stuff that we say without thinking about it you know like just put a splash of cold water on your face or go get a breath of fresh air or you know have a cold shower to wake you up it's all of those little things that have always been ingrained mm -hmm. in us that we've just lost touch with yeah for sure yeah and, and you know there's a reason why you know when you need to wake yourself up or you want to feel refreshed yeah. splashing that cold water yeah, i hadn't yeah, thought yeah. of that it's it's, yeah. it's a really obvious Kind it's of obvious, metaphor. isn't it, when you think about it? Yeah, and, and I, I mean, I, I've, I've had some mental health struggles over the last year, and I've done many things. Mm. So, you know, fitness is, and when I say mm. fitness, not, not going to the gym pumping iron, mm. but just getting out, and I try to do a run or a good walk yeah, every yeah, single yeah. day. But cold water and heat are the two things. So I, yeah. I have a sauna at home. Yeah. I'm very lucky, and I realise not everyone has access to one but a sauna and a cold water plunge pool or if i'm near the sea yeah. or, or cold or, or fresh water um cold water immersion i cannot tell you how healing yeah that has been yeah. I, uh, more more profound than any medicine or therapy i could ever yeah. have been given yeah. and no, it's different for different people i always need to add the caveat you know you need to be sensible before you do the cold mm -hmm. water if you've got a weak heart all of those things but yeah. uh, i would say to most people just go for it and yeah. the power of the natural world is amazing it's amazing i mean is there has there ever been a time when you feel like you've been too cold <laughs> on uh, any of your adventures not really I, I i went to antarctica last year with my great friend Dwayne fields yeah, uh, I love, yeah and I love Dwayne and i had the most amazing adventure yeah, it looked and it. we did i managed to persuade him to strip off and run <laughs> naked around in the snow which even Dwayne, i think thought was completely bonkers but you know what those are the that's what makes those experiences last a lifetime yeah because you know you were we were freezing yes in answer to question yeah we yeah. did get really cold <laughs> but would it have been as memorable had we not done all those things you know the, the reason that whole experience mm. was so unbelievably memorable was because we were sleeping in molting reindeer sleeping bags yeah. and because we were wearing ridiculous victorian costumes but it was such an amazing adventure and, yeah. and one that i think challenged each of us in different ways but yeah. it was a shared experience as well was there anything you really missed on that trip because i know you were using sort of like old uh, like tech and things like that was there anything that you were like oh i could really do with that piece of kit right now any everything anything <laughs> no no do you know what? actually most of the kit the the, the bits i think duane and i would probably be aligned on this uh this a sleeping bag 
because the yeah. sleeping bags were miserable. Yeah. Because uh, they molted all their fur over us, and it was just. Non-stop. It's, I've got I've got dogs at home which molt, but it's on a different level. <laughs> but I would say actually the food. We, we were eating oh, really? this disgusting um, uh, food called pemmican that you actually mix with these hard tack biscuits to create this concoction called hoosh. Mm. And it really <laughs> was miserable. So almost any food other than what we were eating is what I missed. Oh, yeah. damn. That's another, that's another mental one, isn't it, food? Because when you start thinking about the things you're missing, mm-hmm. you can really go on a downward spiral. Well, because you can then start thinking, what's the point? Why am I doing this? I could yeah. be having a fantasize nice, exactly. about things. But that's also quite fun, you know, because it means that when you do get back to that spaggy bowl or whatever <laughs> it is that you've been longing for, yeah. it, well, or that big bowl of salty chips, that seems to be what I always... Is that your I, thing? That, that's salty my chip. I, Salty <laughs> chips is what I'm always craving. And it means that when you finally get to that salty chips, it, so is, it tastes better than anything anything you will have ever yeah. had before and yeah. that's kind of part of it i and think it that there's more a, special yeah i think you know there's a great philosopher who wrote a, a book called the art of travel called alain de botton and he wrote that actually the best part of most trips is not the trip itself because mm-hmm. that can usually be quite grim and miserable yeah. full of suffering and hardships yeah. it's the anticipation yes yeah going around the show here, getting all your kit yeah, together. Yeah, 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 and yeah. it's the retrospective reflection, and sitting yeah. there and going, oh, proud, proud and, and the pride of mm-hmm. talking about what you have done. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that people underestimate sometimes <laughs> the actuality of doing the things. They're not always going to be great fun. No. And that's all part of the mindset. Yeah. And it's what you, yeah, it's what you get afterwards. And the more you do things that make you proud of yourself, the prouder you feel, the prouder you feel, you build confidence in yourself. You just feel like a total badass. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah, me too. It was honestly, it's been such a pleasure talking with you today. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time and I'll hopefully see you out there yeah. in the wild. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. What a genuinely lovely and inspiring person and interview. And now we're going to head over to something you may not have heard of, a bit of Swim Run. Hey, so I'm here today with um, Fred and Chelsea from Swim Run UK. And we'll be chatting a bit about Swim Run. So I've got a bit of a past in Swim Run. I used to work for a Swim Run race organiser. But for those who don't know the sport, because I think whenever I mention Swim Run to people, they're like, what's that? Is it a duathlon? So what is Swim Run? What is swim run? Yeah. Well, swim run is basically running and swimming in alternate uh, in beautiful places. Mm -hmm. So it's not triathlon without the bike. It's its own distinct sport Mm -hmm. where you are, you might do five or six run stages and five or six of swim stages. And so you start in the same gear that you finish Mm -hmm. in. So that means running in your wetsuit, swimming in your trainers. Yeah, I think when I've tried to describe it to people, I always use that, like that you run in your wetsuit, you swim in your trainers. I think that really gets across to people the difference between those kind of transition style sports. So what do you do at Swim Run UK? So Swim Run UK is like a group of uh, race organisers and swim run enthusiasts that are trying to grow the sport in the UK because it's quite small mm. at the moment. Um, we're trying to get more people involved, get more people out um, and enjoying what is quite an epic sport. Yeah. What makes what makes it so epic? Like, why do you love it so much? Uh, running around, <laughs> running around in a wetsuit. I think it's the people. Yeah. I don't know if you'd say the same, Chelsea, but like, it, the people in swim run are lovely. They're friendly. We're all a bit mm-hmm. bonkers, but you see the same people at different events, and it's just so it's so mm-hmm. much fun as well. Like, it's proper fun, isn't it? Yeah, I think you can treat it as a race as well if you want to. Mm-hmm. You can be really competitive, or you can just go for an adventure. Mm-hmm. I'm not an athlete by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm a proper adventurous soul. So actually, swim run's perfect because I can be out and swimming and running, but you see so much more, and you go places you wouldn't normally get to swim or run yeah. because you're out on an adventure. Mm-hmm. I think that was definitely the thing I loved about it. It did feel like a proper adventure yeah. whereas sometimes like you enter a road race or like a running race in general and you're like oh it, it is what it like I love running but there was something about swim run that did just feel 
like really like an adventure a bit wild yeah yeah the funniest thing was like doing training like i remember me and my partner sophie mm. um my swim run partner we did was training on like, hampstead heath and people we so we do like a bit in the pond and then like a lap around the park and people are just looking at you on a saturday afternoon like why are you in your wetsuit <laughs> are you okay? running around the park i think the best comment i ever got was like oh my god this is really james bond <laughs> yeah. as i'm fighting with a swim hat and tripping yeah. out over my pool boy i'm like oh, i'm not sure yeah. but okay i'll take it yeah. and do you do so uh, the race that I did was a partnered race which mm. was like something I really liked about it to be honest because I think like running stuff can be quite solo are they all partnered or do you do some solo races as well I uh, know so you can do both now quite a lot okay. of the most organizers now do solo races mm -hmm. as well as partnered but even as a solo race what we find is people tend to group together out on yeah. the swim run and they kind of end up as a big chatty group and help each other and unlike triathlon where you're told right you can't help anyone who's disqualified yeah. we expect you to in swim okay. run which is a really nice thing so we expect you to help each other and get involved and stuck in and what kind of places could people expect to race in around the UK I, th I think it really changes. There's coastal races, there are inland races. So most of um, Chelsea's events, yeah. they're they're mainly inland, yeah. aren't yeah. they? In sort of reservoirs yeah. and lakes, uh, some river races. Yeah. So anywhere which has got water, yeah, you could probably <laughs> do a swim run. Yeah, yeah I think I, I loved. Um, I did it with my friend Sophie and she's just much better at me than everything. So I loved the fact that we were tethered together and she yeah. had to drag me along <laughs> on the swim. I was like, can we do everything like yeah. this? It was really fun. So people like, have, like love the sound of this. How do they go about finding races? Um, so with there's the Swim Run UK, um, most of the race organisers are on there. Um, there's loads of pages on Facebook, loads of forums mm. and things like that. The Swim Run UK uh, official Facebook, pay, um, Facebook page and group and there's loads of advice and help mm. and point you in the right direction. Because um, there's there is a growing number of events around the country yeah. now, which oh, is good. I, I, I and swimrun.com. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I would add I'm I'm the editor of a um, very interesting publication <laughs> called swimrun.com. Nice, um, excellent journalism on swimrun.com. Well. So imagine <laughs> some good tips there. <laughs> there are a few few pointers. A so few if pointers. if you had to give like just to end on, if you had to give one tip to someone doing their first swim run, what would it be? That's a really hard one to sort of put on the spot. I think, I think don't worry about it. So a lot of people worry about sort of the gear, mm. what to eat. Don't worry about it. Give it a go. You will be very welcomed at like different mm. events and in the community. So just just have a go. Cool. I like that. Yeah, I think I mirror that one. Don't make it too complicated. You can do it in your trainers and your your swimming costume yeah. if you want to. Your shorts and your t-shirt, your tri suit, whatever you want. Everyone is so friendly. It's one of the friendliest sports out there. So it doesn't matter what you turn up in. Everyone will help you around. You'll catch the bug, and then you'll be then you'll be stuck. Yeah, I definitely found that because I, I remember when I did it, it was fairly long, and I looked at the swimming. I'm not a very good swimmer. I looked at the swim distance. I thought I can't do that, but mm. because it's all broken up mm. and like people were really friendly, a partner. Yeah, it was. I definitely echo that kind of community feel of yeah. swim runs. Great. Oh, thanks so much for coming on. Um, and yeah, if you're keen to um, get involved in a swim run, then check out Swim Run UK. Sustainable. Sustainability is such a big part of enjoying the outdoors, which is why I love this next section with Tasmin from Dry Rope. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this section of advice where I'm here with Taz from Dry Rope to talk about how to be sustainable in your adventures outside and on the water. So, Taz, first of all, for people who don't know Dry Rope, what are Dry Rope all about and why is sustainability important to you guys? Yeah, so Dry Rope is a changing robe. It was designed to keep people warm and help people get changed when they come out of the sea. Our founder created it. He's a big surfer. Um, he used to really enjoy his surfing sessions. And when he got home, his mum was like, how was your surf session? He was like, yeah, it's good. You just really get like really cold getting changed in the car park. So his mum's like, I can help. So then she made the first dry robe. Then his, like, he shared it around with all his friends in the car park and they all wanted one after that. So that's how it grew um, in the Southwest. And then now everyone's got them as we can see. And I think we believe that we love the outdoors. We need to do everything we can to protect it. We know we're seeing all the issues we're facing with climate change, the litter on our beaches, the microplastics, everything. We're seeing all of this. Like We try and do everything we possibly can to preserve resource of the planet, also picking up litter, also um, restoring nature as well. So we do everything we possibly can um, with that. Uh, which I think is brilliant, and we see dry robes everywhere. And it should be said, it's not just for uh, for surfers, because you know people like me will use them for ultra runs and things like that when you're getting changed. So it's it's a really cool product. But 
I'm with you on sustainability. And actually, as people who love the outdoors, I think it can often be a bit daunting to sort of go outside. You end up feeling quite guilty for everything that you do. So what kind of top tips have you got for people like me who, who have good intentions but actually don't really know what to do? Yeah, so I guess if you look at the kit you're buying, um, there are easy things you can look at. So we're a B Corp, which means that we look after the planet, the community, our workers, our supply chain, our customers, everyone, all the stakeholders. So so what yeah. B Corp is an, an independent accreditation, yeah. right? And you're regularly checked. So what does that mean? So every three years, we have to go through the recertification. We get checked on everything. We have to pro- provide true... Um, proof on everything as well so you can't just go and say I'm making this out of recycled materials you have to have the certification the backup so if you're buying from a B Corp you know they're doing good for that business everyone that's related to them they're doing something really good I think that's a really good point so if you're looking to buy a kit and you see B Corp is the company that you're buying from is B Corp that's kind of a tick box and it's not just it's a real thing and it's actually got some independent checks and accreditation so that's Mm -hmm. a great tip what else you got so also Make sure that if you're buying something, try and buy things that are made from recycled materials. That means we're com- we're preserving the planetary resource, so we're not supporting the oil coming out of the ground or the sea or anything like that. We're supporting the regeneration of material that's already there. So mm. our fabrics are made from pre and post consumer waste. So that's stuff that would have gone for recycling or landfill, but we have put that into a product that's going to last for a very long time. Amazing. Rather, yeah. <laughs> okay, and that, so, and that will be clearly labelled, so most companies yes. will have that. So, okay, yeah. B Corp, recycled materials, anything else that we can do? Yes, yeah, so when you're purchasing something, buy really well. Yeah. Buy something that's going to last. If you're buying something that's, like, let's say, a cheap version or something, it may not last as long, yes. which means you're going to have to replace it. If you buy something, try and repair it as well. Don't mm. just throw it away and get another one. Like, Try and repair it. Um, also, buying second hand is a really good kit outdoor kit lasts for so long and it's normally really fit for purpose for a long long time so just buy well and buy better every time love that that's a really good idea and then you talked about some of the values of dry rope as a company and sort of litter picking and things like that so is there stuff like that that we could maybe do what could we do if we're out on the water absolutely so anytime you go to the beach you might look at it and think oh it's really clean it's really pristine but if you look a bit closer you might see microplastics you might see nurdles you can what's a nurdle so a nurdle they are basically the, if you imagine anything that's made out of plastic, mm. they're the original bits of plastic, the little plastic balls basically that are okay. used in manufacturing and then transformed into a product. A lot of the time on shipping containers, they're stacked right at the top. When you are stacking <laughs> shipping containers, apparently the price gets cheaper the higher they get stacked. So they're more likely to fall into the ocean. So mm. they're really cheap at being <laughs> transported as well. So you'll quite often see these on the beaches. But... If you're on the beach and you see these, you can collect them up and you can count them and then submit them to the Great Nerdle Hunt. And also you can submit your data to Marine Conservation Society as well. And it all helps them gather data to then make changes with um, the government and things as well. So there's lots oh. you can do. So actually not just litter picking, but actually reporting what you're collecting to the appropriate place because that will enable campaigns and stuff. Absolutely. Um, and one thing I do want to talk about is is sort of carbon offsetting because I know as a brand you're trying to be super sustainable. People out there might have heard about this, which is we're a net zero brand or we're a carbon neutral brand. And, and Dry Robe have got some quite interesting thoughts on this, right? Yeah, so we do monitor our carbon footprint and... Um, we have previously planted trees to offset our carbon footprint. However, in our mind, we feel that that can be seen as a bit of a cop-out from mm. lots of people. So people aren't actually reducing their emissions. They're just trying to balance to make, yeah. make it better, I guess. There's but nothing <laughs> wrong with that because they're no. at least doing something. But it's, I agree, it's kind of yeah. not quite the right way. So what, what, what are you thinking? Yeah, so what we started doing this year is we're doing nature restoration with blue carbon stores. So blue carbon stores are when we have things like mangroves or seagrass or kelp, and they're based in the shoreline or in the sea, and they're super great at absorbing CO2. So it's, I think it's up to like 10 times more carbon is stored mm. within blue carbon stores rather than rainforests, which are also amazing, but also it really helps biodiversity flourish. It gives local communities like a reason to connect with nature again. It helps increase fish stocks and things too. 
Oh, I think that's really cool. Look, it's it's been awesome to learn a bit more about dry robe and actually really impressive around your sustainability credentials. So um, I think thank you for sharing all of that. And uh, this has been a really, really inspiring section for me. So thanks very much thanks. for joining us. Thanks for having me as well. <laughs> On to the next section, guys. Thank you. Hands up if, like me, you did not know what a nerder was, but now I know what to look out for. Let's head back for a final word from our hosts. Thank you, everybody, for sticking with us, and a huge thank you to our sponsors, Yonder, who have given away the Ultimate Swim Bundle. Check out the notes in the show notes for how to get that. But before we leave you, I would like to talk to our awesome hosts about their ultimate water adventure. I think today's been really inspirational in terms of all the stuff we've heard. So, guys, if you can take me somewhere today, let's take the three of us away on a water adventure. What would we do? Elise, I'm coming to you first. So I think the thing I find really interesting about water is what a different like perspective it gives you. When I was doing my run around the coast, I met up with Charlie Head, who at the time was trying to stand up paddleboard around the coast, and we crossed oh paths. Nice. And it was just he had so many different things that we'd done the same journey, but just his perspective on it was so different, like from yeah. the sea. So I'd love to go and like yeah, like kayak or paddle or something around a bit of coast that I know well to see it from there. So I love the Southwest Coast Path. So maybe we could go and kayak around Cornwall how long oh. would that take us I'm sure like a couple of hours I think it'd <laughs> <Yeah>. be fine <laughs> right <laughs> I'd, I'd be quite up for that yeah, I think a bit I'd be up for that yeah Right, okay, right, well, that's, we've got, we've got, we've got a list. I feel like we're doing a fairly good job on this podcast. So if anybody's watching this and wants to take us somewhere really cool in <laughs> kayaks or stand-up paddle boards, we'll have a bit of that. We're in. Tineke, what are you going for? Um, I think personally the like deep water and the sea is sort of like one of a, a bit of a fear of mine. So I wouldn't mind some kind of scuba situation. Yes. I want to get in and amongst it to try and sort of break this fear. I think it's especially when I'm swimming over something big like have um, you done it before i i have scuba yeah. before yeah and it was great but i would like to maybe go into a ship or something do oh. you know what i mean like i'd like to swim into a wreckage yeah because i've seen way too many movies do you know what i mean and i know that that's that. where the bad <laughs> stuff happens so i want to go into the eye of the storm and get over that little fear i've got so i'm quite scared of fish so we can overcome a few fears together. on this trip and you're scuba. scared of fish brilliant <laughs> we're totally going Honestly, scuba like, if you like when I go into like a lake, I just have to pretend there's nothing in there. And as soon as I see a fish, I'm out. Yeah, fair. I think a lot of people are quite scared of below the water, but I've, mm. I've done a few scubas and they're absolutely brilliant. Yeah. It's amazing. Actually, yeah. In Fiji, I went over a coral shelf and just seeing the ocean drop away and feeling yeah. the temperature the drop off. just change. It's like, it's really awesome and inspiring yeah. and you realise how, to our earlier point, big the water is. Well, there's, whole world <laughs> there. there's literally a whole world under the water isn't it that we don't really know that like the deep sea like that's it's a good one really deep <laughs> that's a good one <laughs> that is Whatever that is the point that we're going to end up the deep sea is like well deep uh, so well done Elise thank you for sharing that um, more great I, facts next week <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the National Outdoor Pod Show and again a big thank you to our sponsors Yonder who are giving away the ultimate swim bundle um, so follow the show notes for that and we will see you again next week and that brings us to the end of episode two of the National Outdoor Pod Show. Thank you so much for listening. Like I said at the beginning, please like, subscribe, comment, tell us what you think and tune back in next weekend when we head for the theme of climbing. See you then.